Hello, sportsmen. Hey, goose season just opened here in southern Michigan. We're going to bring you a report on goose hunting. I tell you, we did some good. We have a great recipe, all kinds of information, fast-paced show. This is the first one of our new TV season. So you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost with tips on how you can become a more practical sportsman. Now, this is where you hope you didn't make a mistake. It's daybreak on a farm pond. Wildlife artist and hunter Larry Corey is setting goose decoys. It's the opening day of a special early goose season in southern Michigan. Rob Lewis from Okemos sets up a makeshift blind from burlap and wooden stakes along the water's edge. The geese that'll be coming into this pond use it every day in between their feeding sprees in surrounding farm fields. Larry Corey sets decoys, then unravels some camouflage material to drape over his blind, which is partially covered with grass, which he pulled from around the blind. Geese are big birds, tough birds, and I use big shells, 12-gauge, 3.5-inch magnums, copper-plated steel BBs, 1 and 9 16 ounces. The price of a box is 18 bucks. Add to this a $15 federal duck stamp, a $4 state stamp and a $10 small game license. That's nearly 29 bucks for the basic licenses. This cost, the decline in waterfowl and the complex regulations have reduced the number of waterfowl hunters dramatically across the United States. My Mossberg Ultimag shoots these three and a half inch shells, but it's plugged so the gun can only hold three. That's a federal regulation for waterfowl hunting. Now I put the safety on, set the gun in the blind, and this is where I'll spend the next few hours. Because the grass is wet, I wear my Gore-Tex insulated pants for the first few hours to keep dry. Goose hunting is exciting, calling and watching the geese come in. For the next minute, you'll see what it's like to sit in a goose blind. I like the looks of this. of them. Now this is where you hope you didn't make a mistake and they're going to make one more turn. Come on, one more turn. Now it looks like both flocks are passing us by, so we work harder on the calls. Finally, after all this anticipation, two geese are down. Rob Lewis's retriever, Bubba, jumps into action, first getting the goose that landed in the field. Bubba is well trained. Good boy. Good boy. Good bird. A well trained dog is not only helpful, but it's a pleasure to be around. Oh, here's more geese. There's no predicting exactly when geese are going to appear. They often surprise you. 
Now this group of eight wants to come down, setting their wings. But the green duckweed that blew into our side of the pond isn't something geese like to land in. So they plop down in the open water, which is out of gun range. Out of range. Uh -oh. one over your head. I think you can take that one. Oh, you got it. That was with the pin gauge. Wildlife artist Richard Tim got that goose with a 10-gauge goose gun, a big shell that reaches out a few extra yards with lots of power. And one goose makes a few final post-mortem reflexes on the water, but all the rest got away. That's not good news for farmers and golf course owners and people with big yards who are plagued by these local Canada geese. This early season is designed to remove some of these problem geese from the flocks. Hey, a good dog is invaluable. <laughs> that thing stroke. Bubba has to work for this goose. It's a long way from the blind, and he had to cross a lot of water to get it before his Next tough week. job begins. A lot of people enjoy the beauty of something like that. that the These local Canada geese are the giant variety, often weighing more than 10 pounds. Now, that's not just a mouthful for a dog, but it's a lot of dead weight to bring back to the blind. Bubba wanders a little bit after he gets on shore because he's tired. I'm sure Bubba looks forward to duck season when his job will become easier and more fun for him. But Rob Lewis is happy, probably happier to see his dog do a good job than anything. In fact, we all enjoy watching good dog work. Nelson Hurst and Richard Tim know that training a retriever to obey like this takes daily work, but it's worth it. I managed to get one goose this morning, but this year I thought I'd better do something I've never done before, which is required by federal law. Tag your waterfowl if they're mixed with birds taken by other hunters. Now, this wouldn't be a good time for me to get nailed on a technicality. Every now and then a hunter takes a goose that has a metal band on its leg. Nelson Hurst has taken a half dozen banded geese and a couple ducks. In the duck hunter's tradition, he displays them on his duck and goose call lanyard around his neck which means he's an experienced hunter. Now, do you have to leave this on, taking this goose out of the field? No, you could take it off now. Take it off. Oh. All they want you to do is send in numbers on the band. Oh, you keep the band, send in the keep numbers. Keep the band, and send in numbers, tell them where you shot it at, what county, what state, and then they will send you back a computer printout, tell you what sex the bird is, where it's been banded, and how many times they've reclocked that bird in their traps. Huh. They give you the whole life history on it. I'll be darned. I shot one here a couple, three years ago that was from Hudson Bay. It was nine years old, and it, they'd uh, trapped it clear down in southern Illinois before. Now, theoretically, this bird should be a Michigan bird from yeah. right around here. So the, band shouldn't have any the idea behind the early goose season with a liberal limit of five geese is to trim down the numbers of local geese that have become such a nuisance on farms and in urban areas. The regular goose season, where hunters take migratory geese coming down from Canada, that opens later and has more restrictive limits. But resident goose populations have exploded to problem levels, which makes an early goose season a practical solution. Now for some practical tips on goose hunting. You don't need a lot of gear. Uh, you need probably a 12 gauge shotgun. It doesn't have to be an Ultimag like this. It holds three and a half inch shells. It doesn't really have to be camouflaged either, but it helps. Camouflage can be important in goose hunting. Uh, the camouflage outfit I'm wearing, of course I got real tree from head to toe, the hat, the whole bit, uh, but you can blend right in to the surroundings. Now I use a bucket to sit on oftentimes. In fact, I carry this for all of my outdoor activities. But in the bucket, there's a number of things you can carry. You could just take some material, and it could even be burlap, and you could set it up on some wooden stakes or even just set it up on some trees uh, and make a little blind like that. This is also a poncho you can put over your head in case you don't have camouflage clothing. Um, as far as a mask, something so your face doesn't show up so much, uh, you can use a hood. My glasses get fogged up when I wear hoods like that, so I prefer just to keep my head down when the geese are coming over. If I am going to wear something, over my head, it would be a mosquito net like this that I can breathe through, and this is a regular mosquito poncho, and that helps. Uh, another thing, 
These pants I'm wearing, these are sort of a military style pant, but they have buttons over pockets on the side. Very handy for keeping things like mosquito repellent, even your car keys and things like that, you can button down so you don't lose them when you're out in the field. Sometimes they can slip out of your pocket if you're laying down goose hunting. In the bucket, I carry my shotgun shells, other things I need, my goose call around my neck. But let me show you something that is really slick. This blind right here is a deer hunting type blind. It's called a super blind, made up in Marquette. And this blind is uniquely adapted to goose hunting. Look at this, John. Take the top right off. You can be sitting in here calling geese, uh, remaining hidden, and see with the goose call, that's really all you really need. You don't necessarily need decoys if you're in a good spot. But when the geese come over, you could stand up and shoot. So this is quite a versatile blind, something we're going to get to on a future show. Goose hunting doesn't have to be that expensive or difficult. Hey, you could also use this to take home videos from. There's a backseat driver in the car on the left. Now, he doesn't have a license, but nobody's going to give him a ticket. Rob Torp is behind the camera, but do you have any idea who's behind the wheel of his car? Backing its way out the window was a rather large black bear, probably looking for donuts or candy it smelled in the car. What are you doing up on my car, boy? Well, don't think this is all humorous, though. A three or four hundred pound black bear can scratch the heck out of the paint on a car. Now, they can be destructive, but they're normally not hostile. Rob Torp from Brimley was unharmed, but he had an exciting moment on videotape. That's a beautiful fish. What was it? Uh, did it jump? Two or three times, and I kept saying, stay on, stay on. So what'd you do? I stuck the rod in the water, keep it on. Oh, so it wouldn't jump anymore? Because mm -hmm. you were afraid if it jumped, it could throw the hook. Oh, yeah. My heart was in my throat and everything else. So you cranked it up, and, and then you, you got it up to the boat and did what? I yelled at the guy in the back of the boat, don't miss it. And he missed the first time. And then what'd you say? Get it the second time. Oh, I bet that's what you said. <laughs> I could just add, well, that sounds like my question. Get it the second time. Well, normally, outdoor vocabulary is a little more colorful than that, but Paul DeWeiss from Bay City told a good story about this 20-inch smallmouth bass. He caught it on a rattle trap in Otsego Lake at noontime on August 31st. Now, what does it take to bring a smile to a youngster's face? Well, a big bluegill like this would bring a smile to any angler's face. It's 10 and a half inches. Ryan Akers from Romulus caught it from Houghton Lake. It weighed one pound, four ounces. Now, in our Youth Hunting Awards category, 14-year-old Brian Rentamaki from Newberry got a 10-point for his first buck opening day in Luce County. Brian was hunting with a single-shot H&R topper. One slug, one chance, one shot. Brian Rentamaki passed the test. Brian Malone from Warren was hunting Oakland County with his 70-pound Pearson bow when this 11-point buck with a 23-and-a-half-inch spread came in. A huge rack. This buck had 12-inch tines. You grunted it in? Yes, I did. On October 12th, uh, I grunted once when I first got out there, waited about a half hour, grunted again, and he just came busting in. He was looking for a fight. He had his head down, much like I mounted him. Uh, and just waited, finally he gave me a shot. One of the interesting things about it is he looked at me and I thought it was all over. I thought, he's gone. He stared at me for a while, he saw me draw. And uh, just waited and finally he went back to business, stuck his head back down, started walking away from me. And uh, I just happened to place the arrow right and he went 35 yards and dropped. Yeah. What a dream to get a buck like Brian Malone's. It's a good way to wrap up our Practical Sportsman Trophies of the Week. This dish is not just, I'm sure, going to be a very tasty dish, but look at the presentation. Looks like little flowers there made out of um, carrots. Carrots. Carrots, and what is that? Oh, from... That's um, just some um, cucumber peel. It, to jazz up the plate. That's because right. Because Melanie Morris has been a winner before in our cooking contest, mm -hmm. and you entered Mount Pleasant Pheasant Cheese Soup, huh? That's right. 
Greg, did you get these pheasants? Mm, I'd like to say I did, but I didn't, Fred. But I'm going to have some. This is actually um, provided by a friend of ours that has some land in Mount Pleasant and mm. um, happened to have one there. And Maybe if you mention his name, he'll let me hunt there next year. No. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> well, this, is, this is scrumptious. You I like mean, this. I, I love it. Now, do you want to know what's in it? Yes. Okay. Pheasant. Mm -hmm. Um... Boned out. Yes, uh, boned mostly out. mostly breast. Mm -hmm. I, I used a little bit of thigh right. meat and I a little bit of leg meat. meat. Right here. There's um, green and regular onion mm -hmm. chopped. There's cabbage. Mm -hmm. mm. There's chicken broth and um, a variety of spices, mostly marjoram, thyme, it's dill. Hmm. Dill is very prevalent. What is the cheese? The cheese is um, cheddar and Swiss. I'll be darned. And you have to add it very, very slowly so it doesn't mm -hmm. clump together and like. Man, I, like it, a, you know what? I don't know. It, this this is a dish that would be served in a gourmet restaurant. Big hit at home. Big hit. How do Big the kids hit. like it? The kids love it. Love it. They request it. Man, um, you. you also start off with um, sautéing off some bacon mm -hmm. and then sautéing your your onion and cabbage in it. And that gives it some wonderful flavor. And at the very end, you add um, cayenne pepper, cayenne pepper actually, and cream. But it's I'm easy. a real cream fan. Are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I tell you, this is dishes. this is really, really good. A lot of ingredients, but not that complicated to make. No. Boy, this would <clears throat> this would be. This cold. also keeps real well, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. You can make more than you need, and it'll uh, sit for a couple days, and it's good reheated. Were Were you serious when you said this is good cold? It's good cold, mm -hmm. but. It's better warmed up, but I mean, you can eat it cold, and it's it's just you. wonderful. Mm. It's good munchy food. Munchy food, wonderful. That's the key to this recipe. Thank you, Melanie. This is this is terrific. You're welcome. Do you want a copy of that recipe? Hey, it's in the August September issue of the Practical Sportsman magazine. The you may have read in the newspapers that in England, animal rights groups are trying to ban circus acts that use animals. Well, this is all uses of animals in circuses, and they're going for a worldwide ban. Now, what they don't tell you is that their so-called facts are not based on any scientific studies, and there's no evidence that indicates that when animals pace that they're unhealthy, pacing may very well be a harmless adaptive behavior. Earlier this summer, an 11-year-old girl died from rabies in Albany, New York. Now, that was New York's first rabies death since 1954 and the 20th in the United States since 1979. The spread of rabies is due in large part to an uncontrolled predator and fur bearer population. And these animals' populations have exploded since animal rights activists have depressed the fur market. Now, some good fishing news. DNR surveys showed that Lake Michigan ports south of Frankfurt had significantly better brown trout and salmon fishing success this past year. So was early spring fishing on Lake Huron. However, ports north of Frankfurt saw success drop to 10 percent of what it was a year ago. And last week, the state Supreme Court ruled that Governor Engler has the right to reorganize the DNR. This ended two years of court battles and paves the way for the governor to make other changes he feels are necessary for efficient administration of state government. The news about Governor Engler's court victory is the best news I've heard in a long time for the sportsmen of Michigan. Now, I totally agree with the Detroit News in their editorial last Sunday that said the DNR ruling means that the people win. Now, you'll hear a lot of whining by the environmental groups who say the average citizen won't have input into the DNR, but that's a bunch of baloney. The average citizen hasn't had input. It's been the special interest groups, the environmental doomsday people, the ones who would spend every last dime on questionable environmental projects who have controlled how the DNR is run and how our money is being spent. Now, one environmental guru said that this ruling is, quote, tragic, that it set conservation back 50 years. Well, this ruling maybe set environmental fanatics back 50 years, but sportsmen and the general public are winners. Now the road is paved to maybe get a fish and game department back again, thanks to Governor Engler. To the class if you're a kid and if you're an adult and you want an extremely informative course on how guns work, some of the inside story, powders and all of that, um, you have to bring a kid with you. So if you're a kid, bring an adult. If you're an adult, bring a kid. You see the outdoors is, is, is all about having families together, people together, young people and old people. 
I'm not running a daycare center here with this youth weekend. So come on out with a friend, a youngster or an oldster. Take our classes and enjoy yourself. And above all, get outdoors this weekend if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on The Practical Sportsman, we'll take a look at the upcoming small game season in Michigan, what populations are up and what's down this year. We'll also talk with Federal Fish and Wildlife Agent about some waterfowl regulations that aren't often enforced by state conservation officers, but if you violate them around a federal agent, you'll get a ticket. These regulations are definitely practical to know. I'm setting up an interview with Governor Engler to find out what his plans are with the DNR and how it might affect sportsmen in the coming years. So be sure to join me next week right here, same time, same station, for a brand new edition of The Practical Sportsman.